this point you make again and again, you've made it here, and, and it's the very title of your book, The Gift of Fear, there's one thing that we are actually very good at. Evolution has made us experts at detecting danger and detecting shady people, you know, fe- feeling uncomfortable in the presence of people who are liable to do us harm. Talk about intuition here and what it means to trust it and why so many people are unaware of the, the, the validity of trusting it, the reasons given for not trusting it. Talk about the primacy of intuition for a moment. Well, here we get to, I think, the biggest gift we can give to listeners. And, it, and this goes for female listeners and male listeners. This goes for decisions you make in your work uh, and decisions you make for your safety. Ultimately, the biggest decision we all make is who to include in our life and who to exclude from our life. That's choosing friends, uh, spouse, neighbors, all, uh, you know, uh, uh, co-workers, et cetera. We make those choices. Those choices aren't made for us. And so my advice always is to make very slow and careful decisions about whom you include in your life and very fast decisions about whom you exclude. So if you have that nanny that you're uncomfortable about, uh, she goes. The only thing that's going to protect you is your own intuition, which is your own ability to recognize that something is up while it's while it's right in front of you or while it's in your environment. And I think, as you said, Sam, it's super hard for people to accept the importance of it because intuition is usually looked on, you know, as uh, with some contempt. It's described as emotional or unreasonable or inexplicable, and husbands make fun of wives for feminine intuition, and they don't take it seriously. But um, what I can tell you about intuition, I learned from the origins of the word itself. The root of the word, inter, means to guard and to protect. Super interesting that that's what it means. We think we're using intuition to make a thousand other decisions, but what it's built for, what it's in this system for, is to guard us and to protect us. But what it does, intuition, is it connects us to the natural world and to our nature so that when we are free from judgment and we've got only perception, we say that thing, you know, in in recounting what happened to us, somehow I knew. So if people will do these two things, one is to pay attention to intuition. It's, in my opinion, it's always right in two important ways. One is, it's always based on something. And two, it always has your best interest at heart. And the question to ask always, this is how, you tell the difference between true fear, like I'm afraid of getting on this plane, and unwarranted fear, worry, anxiety, etc. This is how. True fear will always be based on something in your presence and will always be based on something you perceive. The the signal comes from your perception, from your senses. Unwarranted fear will always be based upon memory. And uh, and so it's something you remember, something you recall, something you're, you're worrying about or something you're thinking about. But something based on your actual environment is a gift, hence the title of that book. There's not an animal in nature that would say, oh, I don't want that gift. Don't tell me when I should be worried about my safety. It's, it's, it's so much trouble. You know, there's no antelope that suddenly is filled with fear and says to itself, it's probably nothing. But human beings every day are engaged in the constant prosecution of their own feelings. And, you know, the, the most vivid example I'm aware of is a woman alone in a building late at night. She's working late in the office and she goes to the elevator The elevator door opens, and there's a guy inside who causes her fear. She's afraid of him. And so what does she do? Most women get into a steel soundproof chamber with someone who causes her fear, something no animal in nature would do. And why does she do it? Because she says, I don't want to be the kind of person who makes a decision because of the guy's race or because his clothes look shabby. I don't want to be like that, or I don't want to offend him, or I don't want to make him angry. She talks herself out of what I call prosecutes her own jury's conclusion. And she talks herself out of it and gets into the elevator. And and as I say, these are things that no animal in nature would ever even remotely contemplate. And human beings do it every day, participating in their own victimization. If you're not going to be motivated by a split-second sense that 
the person who's just come into your presence doesn't mean well or represents a, a physical risk to you, if you are going to forsake that signal based on some, you know, larger social concerns that have been drummed into you, you will be the sort of person who never acts to avoid proximity to violence at the first opportunity. Another one of the signals or predatory strategies is uh, charm or niceness. You know, it's an, I view it as an overrated ability and, and note that I call charm an ability. It's not an inherent feature of somebody's personality. Charm is a directed instrument. It's like rapport building. To charm somebody is to compel or to control them by some kind of allure or attraction. And I encourage people to think of charm as a verb, not a trait. So when somebody says to me, uh, you know, oh, I met this really charming guy. And I say, well, when did you see that he was trying to charm you? Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a verb. And uh, so among all the signals, this one, charm and niceness, is the one that tends to destabilize or distract uh, victims the most often. You know, he's such a nice guy. He looked like such a nice guy. He acted like such a nice guy. Well, how would somebody act who wants you to get in their car other than to act nicely? And so we, we have to learn and teach our children as well that niceness, which is a choice, does not equal goodness. Niceness is a strategy. And people seek to control others always by being nice at the beginning. I'm talking here about women because they get victimized more often by these strategies, is to you know, explicitly rebuff unwanted approaches. And that is something the entire culture has told them never to do. Never be rude, never be cold, never be a bitch. And, and so what, what I have really seen in my career, hard to believe for a lot of people, but important to believe, is that you know, I've studied so many uh, incidents of victimization and all of the behaviors that led up to them on the part of the victim and on the part of the predator. And the, the, the key here is that First and foremost, a woman feel free to rebuff and resist and be a bitch in effect because I have never seen that lead to violence, ever. Have I seen that a stranger's choice to tell somebody, I don't want your help, leave me alone, is the reason that they were victimized. But I've seen thousands of cases where the reason they were victimized is that they allowed someone to stay in their environment. A lot of people say to me, I don't even want to think about this topic. And my response is, do you imagine that not thinking about it is an effective resource in an emergency? Or do you imagine that not thinking about it is somehow a magic amulet that will make it less likely? I'm not recommending to people that they worry. But if you know a great deal about predicting and avoiding violence, and if you know about the dangers that are posed by strangers or by friends or what have you, when your intuition is better informed, I am absolutely certain from now 40 years of this that people have less unwarranted fear of other people because you know that you'll get the fear signal if you need it. And 99% of the time we walk around, you and I are in a restaurant together, fear doesn't even enter into our thinking. And, uh, but if it does, you want to listen and it'll be, it'll be super rare. And I think the result of educating yourself on the nature of predatory strategies, how people behave, uh, what are the pre-incident indicators of various forms of violence. I think the result is that people live far less afraid because the nagging knowledge that, gee, I'm in this world and I don't know anything about this world, that is the cause of anxiety. Information is not the cause of anxiety.